We can have like the bro science, do concentration curls that works the peak of your bicep that somehow you're gonna make like a flat bicep into a mountainous bicep. And you can't change the inherent sh quote unquote shape of a muscle. Hey folks, Dr. Mike here with a even more important Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. Now I know some things about muscle hypertrophy, but I learned most of them from Dr. Schoenfeld, who is the world's ranking expert on muscle growth. Crazy, I know, but that's really a thing you can have nowadays. I'm here to ask Dr. Schoenfeld a different question, and all of the questions I have to ask are about regional hypertrophy. First, what the hell is regional hypertrophy? Before you tell us if it really happens or to what extent, what is it? Yeah, so it really can be one of two things. It can either be the um, hypertrophy between different heads of a given muscle, so like your shoulders, have an anterior, uh, middle, and posterior head, mm -hmm. uh, the quadriceps, you have your uh, rectus femoris, vas lateralis, et cetera. So it could be different differential effects between the muscles themselves. Or, and this is to me really interesting because it goes against what I was taught when I was first coming up. Same. It can be differences along the length of a given muscle, let's say like the vastus lateralis. Um, so when I was an up and coming exercise science student somewhat long ago now, um, we were always taught that muscles develop along the full from insertion to, uh, to the, from proximal to distal end, origin to insertion. And um, that actually has been shown not to be the case. And it's quite interesting that muscles, some of the interesting things are that muscles, uh, certain muscles, many of them, terminate, the actual fibers terminate intrafasciculi. So within the fascicle, they don't necessarily span from origin to insertion. They actually are terminating before the end or, or to, from the middle to the distal portion. And some of these fibers or some of these regions are innervated by different nerves. Mm -hmm. So which gives, again, more credence to an ability for these muscles to uh, hypertrophy in a non-uniform fashion. Yep. So basically, to uh, unscience that really quick, some of our viewers are just not that smart. And I'm one of them. So let me explain this in Jenga block fashion. Um, a muscle, whole muscle, let's say. Mm -hmm. Muscle fiber and muscle cell is the same thing. Correct. So a lot of people think like every muscle fiber goes from all the way top to bottom. And in some muscles, that's true. I think okay. in the sartorius, you got some muscle cells that are insanely long. But in a lot of muscle fiber, in a lot of whole muscles, one muscle cell will go to here, another one will go to here, Correct. another here, and they're even activated by different nerves. Correct. So hypothetically, you could at least see some regional differences Correct. where one part of the muscle grows more from maybe one exercise or one angle or X, Y, Z. We'll get to that in a sec and another part of the muscle grows from others. So that's the idea of regional hypertrophy. Absolutely. Super. Um, the state of the evidence currently on regional hypertrophy, what is your analysis? Yeah, so it's uh, quite clear now, probably not news to most people that you can get different uh, growth in different heads, although in certain respects, there is some interesting information we could talk about as far as that goes. But um, as far as the regional along the length of a muscle, there's now, in my opinion, from my uh, knowledge of the literature, quite compelling evidence, I would say, that you can get regional hypertrophy. And what's really interesting, it can be initiated by different types of training. So let's give you some examples. Eccentric training uh, has been shown. So when you're comparing eccentric, which is the lengthening portion, mm -hmm. for those who know where you're lengthening versus a concentric where you're uh, contracting, quote unquote, shortening. contracting, shortening mm -hmm. the muscle. Um, the eccentric action has been shown, at least in some, stu uh, some research, to have greater growth at the distal portion of the muscle, whereas the uh, concentric action shows greater growth in the middle aspect of the muscle. Uh, so again, somewhat interesting, uh, length and partials becoming a big topic in training now and programming. Um, similarly, that uh, the lengthening aspect seems to show its biggest effects distally, that you're getting the greatest disparity between, uh, let's say, a lengthened partial versus a shortened partial uh, at the distal end. And that it becomes less, even though there, most studies seem to show across the muscle, but the magnitude of the effect is most prominent distally. Interesting, very interesting. This is a big, big question I have for you. Very few people know the answer. I don't even know the answer, I have my suspicions. What is the relative effect magnitude of regional hypertrophy? 
Is it something that we can see on the macro scale? Like, can you look at physiques? And let's say we had a ton of identical twins that were, oh, let's say for hypothetical purposes, living in a Truman Show-esque environment where they thought they were in the real world, but they never were. We just bred them exclusively to study muscle things. They thought they went to school. Turns out nothing even happened. The robot professors, they're all fake, but they train in different ways. Some of them train exclusively in ways that we think will grow distal parts of the muscle. Others train exclusively in ways that will grow proximal parts of the muscle. Is it one of these things in the literature under uh, analysis with deep methods like ultrasound that we can see their fiber differences, but on the grand scale zoomed out, you can't really quite tell? Is it nuanced? You can tell, but you got to look really hard. Or is it like, these are real legit, you can change something like the shape of your muscle kind of differences? Yeah. So the magnitude, we generally are looking at either ultrasound or MRI to, we're not looking at the actual fibers. We're looking at the whole muscle, the whole muscle. Like we're looking at slices along the length of the muscle. And uh, the magnitude in some of the studies is quite large. I mean, it's, in some studies, more than 10% difference. More than 10%. Uh, and some but it's studies, not double, less, it's not 100%. Well, uh, so it depends how your what your metric is. So let's say if you're talking about the difference between 10% versus 20%, is that 100% or is that a 10% difference? So I'm mm. looking at that as a 10% difference. Like on a, on a rel- it's a relative matter, but you can look sure. at it, it's double, double the growth. So if we have 10 units of muscle size and we go through a 12-week training period, one uh, of the comparator conditions grows to 11 units and the other grows to 12 units. Correct. That to you would be a 20%, 10, a 10% difference there, roughly uh, 10%? Math or, was never my strong No, for sure. So was that 10% issue to you or is that 100% issue No, that's tw- that would be 10. So one is 10%, the other is 20%. Got it. So okay. that would be a 10% difference. But you could say, depending upon how you're looking at it. Uh, now, again, how does that manifest over time? So yeah, that's just in a short period of time is that 10 percent or 100 even double that uh, noticeable in that shorter period of time or will that manifest over longer periods does it take six months to really become apparent but the question then becomes will you continue to see the gains right. in that realm? we don't these these are gaps in the literature sure. i would just say that we don't know and the fact that um you're seeing i think a magnitude of difference that is quite in my opinion, quite uh, influential, that it would be, a, I think, you'd be, a, um, you'd be misguided not to take that as something that you'd want to explore. And so is it tenable as a hypothetical to say something like, look, regional hypertrophy differences based on different kinds of training, let's say highly concentric emphasis versus highly eccentric emphasis. Now, most training is dynamic. It trains cool. both. Um, if that difference presents itself as we've seen it in the literature over the long term, is it safe to say like, look, no, it won't radically change the shape of your muscle as seen from external perspective, like on an Instagram photo, but subtly it can change it in such a way that the overall visual picture, like, damn, dude, your biceps do look a little bit fucking kind of longer. Not like you turned into Ronnie Coleman from having total flat biceps, but something that over time can definitely have a qualitative impact on physique. Is that, are you comfortable hypothesizing that? Yeah, so I think we need to be careful at least to clarify when we talk about changing the shape of a muscle, um, there's several connotations to that. So I, we can have like the bro science do concentration curls that works the peak of your bicep that somehow you're going to make like a flat bicep into a mountainous bicep. And you can't change the inherent sh- quote unquote shape of a muscle. If your muscle is going to be rounded rather than peaked, quote unquote, you can't totally. do an exercise that will peak it. So Arnold Schwarzenegger had that, it wasn't the, the training that he did that gave him that peak, that sure. was his bicep, that was his genetics. But you can change the shape of your body, if you will, by making more, hy- getting more hypertrophy in aspects, in certain aspects as opposed to others. And I think that certainly is a, uh, a reasonable and a rational way to go, uh, go about saying it. I'd also, point out that when we're talking about this type of thing, um, if you're going to do, uh, let's say I, I, from a practical standpoint, if you're going to do uh, a program that involves just concentric actions, you may benefit, let's say, from having some 
eccentric overload training involved to target, quote unquote, target the distal aspect of the muscle. So it gives, I think, options for, from a programming standpoint to allow you to, quote unquote, change the shape of your body. Yes. We already know, based on your answer so far, two things. I want to ask if thing number three is a possibility. We know that you can, and we'll get to a bigger expansion of this question in a sec, we can grow differentially. You can stimulate different heads of a muscle, distinct concrete regions. We also know that proximo distal uh, regional hypertrophy is definitely a thing. What about medial lateral hypertrophy differences within a single uh, head of the muscle? So if I say have my like vastus lateralis, is it possible uh, hypothetically to grow more of the outside of it versus the inside in the single given head, or has it just not been illustrated? With of the vastus lateralis, Correct. never been shown. Never been shown. And has it never been shown? Like we've analyzed it, and it it doesn't happen, or no. we've just never tried never, to analyze. Never been. And you're trying to look at the pieces, and like the you generally you're looking at slices that yeah, are going so this way, to, so trying to go to the outside versus inside. And it's vastus lateralis is a relatively thin muscle. Sure. It's not. Sure. So I think that would be difficult to look at. Sure. Okay. And uh, this is a real, real, real practical question. In the real world, do foot and hand positions and let's say elbow and knee tracking, do they make a difference in regional hypertrophy head by head? So the ultimate example of this is if I take a narrow stance in my leg press and have my knees point relatively straight, is that going to grow the outside of my quad more than if I take a wide stance and point my knees really far out? Is that going to grow more of the inside of my quad? Or is the quad a real bad example because all the heads kind of work in synergy? Maybe there are other muscles that are uh, better examples of that. So a couple of things. Um, that has not been shown for the quads. There is some evidence. It's limited, but it's certainly one study in particular did show that turning your in calf raises, now I know you don't care about the calves, but you've got the jack calves already. I do put the in the work. Um, but turning your toes in tends to work the lateral aspect of the gastric nemius, while turning your toes out tends to work the medial aspect. And that's how biomechanical inference would agree. So thank God it's not like totally bonkers where it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is some evidence in the calves of that, not in the... Uh, in the quads, there is evidence that if you take like more of a sumo or wide stance in squats, it's going to work the adductors to a greater extent. To some extent, it depends on the inclination, high bar versus low bar, but your glutes as well. But as far as the quads, no, but uh, that, now that you brought it up, I'll give you another scoop. Our group has a, our lab has a study that's in review, which should be hopefully published soon, uh, where we looked at the quadriceps. We actually looked at the quads and the calves. Um, we looked at the quads doing a leg press. So, and this was within subjects. So one group did a leg press, the other leg did a leg extension. The leg press worked more the vastus lateralis. The leg extension worked more in the rectus femoris. So basically you're getting, you can look at uh, targeting hypertrophy in the given heads of the quads by doing single joint uh, knee extension versus multi-joint uh, knee hip extension. Uh, and for the calves, interestingly, it had always been taught that seated uh, calf raises work the soleus because you're going to make the gastroc actively insufficient and your straight leg work more the gastroc. Straight leg does work more the gastroc. The seated did not really work more of the uh, soleus. It, the gastroc got pretty much just as much growth from the seated as from the uh, the, soleus, the soleus got as much growth. The soleus got the same. In the, in from the, the same. And the, so the gastroc in suffered the, in the seated. Gastroc did not suffer in the seated. Gastroc well, didn't they, they, I'm sorry. They both were less, but they it was not to a uh, correct. Uh, you need to, so correct. You, the, the gastroc did not suffer more than the soleus. Like you got similar, but both were less than the, um, than both standing. muscles than the straight leg. So basically seated calf raises suck like I had suspected for forever. They were not, they are not obligatory, yes. But there are two advantages of them. One is, first of all, almost all the machines look like double dildo handles that you have, which is cool. Practice for day job. Another one is you can put a lot of plates on a seated calf. How are you supposed to impress the ladies, if not with a lot of plates and grunting, of course. Good point. Do you have any research on grunting that we can talk about? Do not. Ah, 
Folks, this has been Dr. Brad Schoenfeld. He knows a lot about actual hypertrophy. His grunting expertise is limited. Next time, we'll ask you about grunting. I'm going to personally fund 17 independent grunting studies. I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. See you guys next time.